Okay, let me introduce our first keynote for today. We're going to have some really great speakers today. I know because I read and covered all of them. Our first spe speaker is Nico Hilch. Nico is a journalist and podcaster. He's uh, based in Vienna. Uh, he's covering Bitcoin, money, and geopolitics in German and English. Good luck. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's lovely to be here. Thank you very much for the um, kind introduction. Um, my name, Yilch, is very hard to pronounce for anyone not coming from Israel, so I'm very happy. Um, and, and it's actually a Czech name. My family, I don't know when they, when they came to Austria. I, did, I, I am from Austria, and I preface this because I'm going to talk about the experience of Eastern Europe in 1980 to 1989. Um, so all, for all Hungarians and Czech people and, and Poles in the, in the audience, I apologize for um, butchering the names of um, the heroes and anti-heroes of uh, the revolution. Um, I mean well, but I really don't know how to pronounce many of them. Um, I have been obsessed with communism for the most part of my life. I, 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 like, I started this in school. I was always the guy to argue with the communists, not even knowing why, but I, I never understood how you could be against a market economy. And I went to Hungary to see the Satoshi Nakamoto statue a couple of uh, weeks ago, a couple of months ago, and I bought a book about 1989 by Victor Sebastian. He's an, an author, a British author, who, who had to flee from Hungary with his family as a kid. Um, and, and I read the book about the revolution, and I thought, yeah, I mean, that's sounds a lot like what we see in Bitcoin today. And I want to talk about this and I want to draw seven lessons from the rebels of 1989 who brought down the evil empire of the Soviet, um, Soviet Union. First of all, it all started in 1980 at the Lenin shipyard in Gdansk um, in Poland. Lech Walesa, well, the, one of the biggest names, of course, of this time. In 1980, the workers, the whole revolution is funny, the whole revolution that brought down the supposedly workers' empire was, the, was a workers' revolution. Um, they demanded better pay and you know, maternity leave, and it was all about price controls. It was a lot about um, um, things that we talk about today. Um, in 1980, and they had a, um, a committee that was, that was the, the, the precursor of Solidarność, the, the first union, the first free union in Poland. And they had a list of demands that they would hang outside the Lenin shipyard. And now you can, you can take a wild guess how many demands they had. It was exactly 21. Solidarność was founded shortly afterwards, and then it was immediately forbidden by the Polish government, and they rolled out martial law for almost 10 years. Um, Solidarność was uh, active in the, in, the, in the underground, but it never died, it always, it always grew. And it ended in 1989. We all know this picture, the Berlin Wall fell, but the story behind it is far less um, spectacular. It's been, a, it's been about slow progress. It's been about people just doing their thing and trying to better their lives one step at a time, and in the end, bringing down communism. And the, one of the main stories, one of the main stories about this is that these people did not actually sit down and say, let's end it, you know? They just wanted one thing, but we'll talk about this. First, a quote. This is not from then, this is from now. If there is an escape, I don't know where there is a third escape. If there is an escape, that escape will be used. This is, of course, from Comrade Christine Lagarde, not from this guy. This guy is um, Erich Honecker is supposed to be an AI version of Erich Honecker, the DDR, uh, the, the GDR, uh, Demo German Democratic Republic, Eastern Germany guy. No, it's from this woman, Comrade Christine Lagarde, who is now the head of the ECB, of course. If there is an escape, it will be used. So if there is a hole in the Iron Curtain, it will be used. I consider Bitcoin to be the hole in the Fiat Iron Curtain. So who were the rebels of 1989? Who were they fighting? They were fighting a vast machine that was built on a dysfunctional economic model. I don't know, for some reason when I export my slides, it always doubles the, the, the words. I don't know why this is happening. It's inflation probably. The vast machine built on a dysfunctional economic model back then, of course, was communism. Today, it's fiat 
capitalism, you know, people want to consider it capitalism, it really isn't, but it's what we have now. It's based on the dysfunctional economic model of central planning. The machine has total control over the media, the education system, and the mainstream narrative. This is crumbling as we, as we speak today, but it's still very, very true for most of the, for most of the world. It's run by arrogant and detached leaders that have been in power for so long that they lost all connection to the, to the plight of the people. I think this is extremely true and you can see it in 1989 and you can see it in 2024. And the, the machine is ensuring its grip on power by the use of state force, draconian laws, increased surveillance and paranoia. Something we can see every day. We just had EU uh, uh, elections. I don't know about any, any of you, the EU wants to read our chats, wants to censor our transactions. None of this has been any topic uh, uh, leading to the, to the election. We talked about the, the climate, that's basically it. The machine is dependent on centralized power that controls all countries and nodes within its sphere of influence and, and this is interesting, the centralized power is slowly losing interest in protecting its cronies in other countries from the, peop from the will of the people. In 1989, with Gorbachev in Moscow, he didn't really think that he could hold together the empire. So the Russians who, who um, cracked down on protest in 1956 in Hungary, in 1968 during the Prague Spring, they sent tanks, they killed the people. In 1989, they didn't. And they sent the signal that they won't, which gave the, pro which gave the rebels um, really like energy, right? And I see the same today, I know this is a little bit far-fetched, but I see the same today with, our, with the, central, the central node of our centralized system, which is of course Washington DC. So what are the seven lessons from 1989 that I could draw for us, for the Bitcoin rebellion? First of all, start small and live free. This sounds a little bit very much like Mahatma Gandhi style, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. I don't know if he even said that, you know. Never trust a quote you read on the internet. I think Abraham Lincoln said that. But it doesn't matter. It's actually from Václav Havel, who basically said, in order to be free, we have to live as if we were free first. So we have to try and we have to step and see if it's safe. And then we have to, we have, there's no, nobody is giving you freedom. This is the most, important, the most important thing. You have to take it and after you have it, you have to defend it. So in 1989, people took it. Today, we have to defend it. This is, of course, Havel, AI version again. He said, hope is a state of mind, not of the world. Hope, because hope, you know, Michael Saylor talks about uh, hope in Bitcoin. Hope is this deep, powerful sense. It's not the same as joy, that things are going well, or willingness to invest in enterprises that are obviously heading for success, but rather an ability to work for something because it is good. Basically, just starting what you think is the right thing to do, not because somebody else says this is the industry you have to go into, but because you think it's a good idea for the world. And I see many of these people, many of these ideas within Bitcoin today. Like Satoshi Nakamoto, he never thought about building a giant industry and he actually never talked about, well, he might have been talking about bringing down central banking a little bit, um, but he just sent it out into the world and we are very thankful for him not to try to be the head guy, right? He just sent it out into the world and disappeared. The fall of the Berlin Wall makes for nice pictures, but it all started in the shipyards, Lech Walesa. It all started with the, sm with, with the, little, the small people, the normal people. It did not start with you know, um, people saying, let's head to the wall and bring it down. For 30 years, the German never thought about bringing down the wall. Even when it came down, most of the German, Eastern German people, they just went to the West, bought some stuff, and then went back home uh, to Eastern Germany. Build your own media, extremely important. It's what I'm doing, it's what many of you are doing. It's what we see in many parts outside of Bitcoin as well. And of course, the rebels of 1989 had the same thing. It's called Samistad. They were printing their own books. They were printing their own media. They were watching Western German television. This is a map of Eastern Germany, right? The black parts are the unfortunate people who could not listen to Western German television. And one thing that today is a problem in the West is that the West does not have to compete with anything anymore. 
it is it, it won, you know, the end of history. And then that's what, why we went down the road of serfdom, the road of socialism after we brought down socialism, with this, which, is, which is ironic, but it happened. So you have to build your own media, you have to build your own channels. That's what we do on, on podcasting, on Twitter, on Nostra. I mean, we're not only building our own media, we're also building our own platforms using the technology um, that Bitcoin brought us. Extremely important is the use of humor and powerful symbols. Meme culture. Bitcoin has the best meme culture in the world. There is no question about that. If you are, if you are a, a victim of, of Bitcoin memers, good luck to you. And it's extremely important to do that. Of course, the logo of Solidarność, I've shown you that. <laughs> this guy, this picture. Like, have, go to Twitter and read any post by Christine Lagarde. 600 Bitcoiners making fun of her. And the thing is that, and we know this from, from Eastern Germany, if there's one thing that centralized leaders and elites within a socialist system are deadly afraid of, it's not violence, it's not people protesting, it's people not taking them seriously, it's people making fun of them. Wolf Biermann, he's a German musician, he was doing songs about the government, but ironic songs, right? You know what they did? Germans are very crafty. They let him go, he said, hey, you're, you're such a good guy, you're such a good singer, you should go to the West and perform there. People in the West will love you. And then when he went to the West, they said, ah, you're not coming back in, ha <laughs> ha. Everybody wants to get out, but you're the guy who doesn't come back in. That's how the Germans, the Eastern Germans get rid of many of their dissidents. Because he was making fun of them and they needed to get rid of him. Four. Keep the goal in mind. Just like Bitcoin today, the rebels of 1989 were not ideologically a block. They didn't align on everything in the world. They were fighting all the time. They didn't, some of them didn't like each other. It doesn't matter if it was in Poland or Czech Republic or Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania. But they knew that they had one goal in mind and that was to bring down the centralized government in the end. Actually, the first goal was just to make things a little bit better. And then it all ended by it falling apart because they realized that the powers that they were fighting were way weaker than anybody thought. They were weaker than the rebels thought and they were weaker than the government itself thought. But you have to keep the goal in mind. And I think this is extremely important. I come from the, from the world of, of gold. I've been a gold bug. So I see the gold bugs as the dissidents. Eastern Europe, Communist Europe, always had dissidents. People who complained that, you know, it's a bit shit here. But they never knew what to do about it. They just complained. That's the gold bucks, right? Because gold is not, it's not digital, it's not good enough to, to be used as an actual tool of rebellion against the fiat centralized system. Bitcoin is. And the goal would be to have an alternative. So the people in, in Eastern Europe knew, they looked at the West, and they knew, well, it's better. Not in every way, of course not in every way, but you know, people are living f their, their lives in a free way. You can buy a car, you don't have to wait for eight years, right? Um, and they knew what they wanted. Before Bitcoin, we did not have an idea of what a world without fiat, fiat centralized banking would look like. Now we do, and we see it every day. Of course, it's still extremely small, you know? We see it within ourselves, we see it within our small community. But we do know it works and we do know it energizes people and gives them hope and optimism. This is from the Communism Museum here in Prague, um, reading the, the, the reviews by Americans and East, Western European leftists. It's funny when you go on, on Google for the Communism Museum, they are like, Communism Museum? More like anti-Communism Museum. Yeah, well. Of course, the devaluation of the currency and inflation always goes together with socialist systems. It's one of the main tools of control, one of the main tools of basically plundering the people. And we've seen this in Czech Republic and any other you know, country in the East, and now we're seeing it in the West, and we've seen it in South America. Most of the 21 points that the people at the Lenin shipyards wanted done, wanted from the government, were connected to money, wages, and the work environment. Stuff that we talk about today, even outside of Bitcoin. It's all about, you know, the cost of living, we need to be paid better, 
the work, the work environment needs to be better, you know, all of these things are very, very closely connected. But the goal that we have in mind is, of course, in the end, what do you do? Bitcoin empowers the individual. Technology empowers the individual. So you fight the forces of collectivism. I think it's very important to realize that, you know, it doesn't really matter if there are rightist statists or leftist statists. I'm talking about leftist statists today, but of course there are right-wing socialists as well. It doesn't really matter. Even nationalism um, is in this, in this. Of course, this is not, you know, this is not a peer-reviewed study. <laughs> But I think, we, I think we get it. Know the enemy. We need to know like, what we are fighting against as well. Not, not, because, you know, not because we hate them. I think it's very important to understand that the people who, who work for a centralized government and people who work for the central bank, they're not all evil. You know? they, just, they just came up in a system. They were told that this is the right way to do it all their lives. You know? The machine that we are, quote unquote, fighting consists of people. The people are good. The people don't want anything bad, most of them. Of course, there are always there's bad people within Bitcoin. Or your yeah, idiots are everywhere, right? But people are not the enemy. I think this is extremely important. Yes, you can make fun of, of, of um, the head of the central bank. But, you know, let's not get too personal. I think this is, this is, this is important. Because the... The machine that, it, that Bitcoin is fighting, a three-day, four-day chess thing, is mostly institutions. And institutions and bureaucracies have their own, their own you know, um, inner, inner life. But the thing that I see with Bitcoin, and this is pretty amazing, is that people, there is Bitcoiners everywhere today. And once you are aligned with Bitcoin, you cannot just sit within the central bank or some ministry and, and support uh, policies that oppose Bitcoin. And we've seen this especially in the, in the East. People within the Eastern European governments, in Poland, in Czech Republic, in Hungary, in 1989, they knew it's over. They absolutely knew it's over. Everybody knew it was over. Eastern Germany, they knew it was over. They knew it, they had no chance, but they still thought they could do, reform the system in order to stay in power because they literally could not fathom a different world, even though it was just very close um, uh, to them, right, in the West. Many people today see the problems, it's not just us. This is also important. We, we look at Bitcoin, we want to convince that people that Bitcoin is the solution, but it's more like doing what Havel said. Living free, being free, showing, them, showing people that there's an alternative, showing people that there's optimism. I don't... I don't go and orange peel people. Honestly, I don't think that the whole idea of orange peeling is a good idea. I think it's just, it's better to just, you know, be fun, be relaxed, um, live your life, and people will see it. Because the stress within the fiat system, the stress within the socialist system we live in today, it's growing anyway. It's, it's, it's like every day it's getting worse. The hamster wheel is getting worse. People are getting more angry, more frustrated. They don't know what to do. And then they open the door and see a Bitcoin party and everybody's like, <laughs> you know, that's how you do it, in my opinion. That's why we should expect a lot of pushback. We are getting that, but also a lot of confusion. There is no grand and vast conspiracy uh, against freedom. There is just people who think that bureaucracy is a good idea, who have jobs in bureaucracies and have to go to the office and come up with stupid laws. So there, is, will be, 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 there will be pushback. For example, this guy, Augustine Carstens, the head of the Bank of International Settlements in Basel. It's supposed to be the central bank of central banks, which is funny in itself, right? Um, he came out in the media. This was during the bear market. And he was like, crypto has lost the battle against fiat currency. Did you realize that 10 years ago, nobody was talking about fiat currency? It was just currency. There was no distinction between fiat currency and Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. Today, that even the head of the central bank does this, uh, this, this um, distinction. And actually, he came out only two, years, uh, two months ago and said, we have a new idea. We want to have a global ledger. That's my North Star, he said. We want to have a global ledger. And I'm like, yeah, we already have, have a global ledger. They are lagging behind. 
and they are trying to gaslight their community and their banking system into thinking that you know they have already won. It's 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 basically it's it, we've seen this for during the, the 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 communist years, the last communist years. We've seen this time and time again. Every step the the government convinced themselves now it's over. You know now we got rid of the rebels. We gave them you know two slotties more per year, and now they're happy. Erich Milke, who was the, the chief of the Stasi, the German secret police, the most efficient, most ruthless, brutal secret police, maybe not the most brutal, the Romanians have to say something about that, but the most efficient secret police in the, in the, Eastern, in the Eastern Bloc, because of course it was the most efficient, it was the German version, right? By the way, East Germany, at its absolute peak, had a, had a, uh, a GDP per capita of one-third of West Germany. And being the fact that the Germans did socialism, and they had, I think that this is actually the maximum efficiency that any form of socialism can ever see. And he did this thing, in 1989, he went to the assembly when, 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 when uh, Eastern Germany was still officially in existence. And he was talking about how the Stasi is doing great work and whatever. And then in the end he said, Ich liebe euch doch alle. Ich liebe alle Menschen. I love you all. I love everybody. That's what he said and people laughed. He was completely delusional. Destroyed the lives of hundreds of, like thousands of people. But then he said he loves everyone. That's the level of delusion we have to, we have to expect from people on this level of government. So, lesson number seven. And I was told that I can take some questions, which I would love to do when I'm done with the presentation. Lesson number seven is the thing that I talked about at the beginning. Cut small holes. Socialism is not brought down by one big revolution. Socialism was, like, like, um, like uh, Valesa said, it wasn't the fall of the Berlin Wall. It was the workers that started it 10 years, almost 10 years prior. Cut holes in the Iron Curtain to bring down the wall. Use the escapes. Do not let them close the escapes. In 1989, German, Eastern Germans went to Hungary on holiday, like they did every year. But the difference was this year, they didn't go back. They said, no, we're not going back, fuck you. We're staying in Hungary. And the Hungarians are like, ah, maybe you go back home? And they said, no, we're not going back, fuck you. And then the, the Germans said, the Germans called Budapest and said, ah, you know, can you just send them back, you know, some, deport them? And the uh, Hungarian said, ah, it's not a good look, you know, it's not a good look, We're not, we, we can't do that. So the Hungarians got together with the Austrians and organized what was called the picnic for Europe. It was just a little, a little thing, little, uh, uh, a day off basically from, from the Cold War. And for four hours they, they opened the borders and the, the, German, the German people, they couldn't even fathom what was happening. Um, they were told by the Hungarians, just go to the border, we'll help you. And suddenly the same border guards who would shoot them two days prior, helped them through like, literally the barbed wire to cross into Austria. 4,000 people crossed into Austria that day. They closed the border again, but they were, the symbol was out there. They showed everybody that it's possible. And only a couple of months later, they opened the border completely and Germans drove into, into, into Western Germany with their trubbies, their Eastern German cars. One, one of the, most, the funniest stories is that Western Germany actually suspended their environmental laws because the cars were not allowed on Western German roads back then. But the German government said, yeah, okay, we can, we can, we can look the other way for, for a couple of weeks here. Hungary was where the first stone was removed from the Berlin Wall, is what Helmut Kohl, the German Chancellor of Unification, said. And this was the moment. Cut little holes into the wall, use the holes, use the escape, do not, like, do not believe the gaslighting. This is Arius Mock, the Austrian Chancellor, uh, the Austrian Foreign Minister, actually cutting holes. This is, of course, a photo op after everything was happening, is politics. And this is basically the way we win. I'm, like, I've been standing on Bitcoin conferences for a couple of years now. Today we talk about you know, ETFs, we talk about sailors on the other stage soon. Um, even Trump is talking about Bitcoin now. Of course, this is not a political statement, but it's already happening anyway. Um, we, can only, we can only help it you know, happen. We can be along for the ride, but we are well on our way of bit for, for Bitcoin to give back some sort of, you know, basically regulation 
to the fiat system, which I think is a very good idea. What will the empire do? I think this is the next big question. That's why I said Trump, and this is what I'm going to end with. Like I said, in 1989, Gorbachev and Moscow, they were busy with their own problems. They didn't care about what's happening in Eastern Europe anymore. They decided that it's no, there's no point in sending tanks. There's no point in sending money. They just let them fall, right? But they never thought like, for a second that the Soviet Union could also end. They were con convinced that it's just that they do the same thing with a couple of reforms and then that's it. And that's the question, what happens to the central, the central part of our fiat system today, which is, of course, the dollar and the Federal Reserve. I talked about Gorbachev. I'm not saying Trump is the Gorbachev, but he already talked about Bitcoin on the national stage. I mean, he's going to debate Biden and they're going to talk about Bitcoin. Think a second how crazy that is. That's completely insane. If you told me a year ago that they would have Bitcoin on the, on the ballot sheet at the American presidential elections in November, it even, is, it even fits perfectly with the Bitcoin cycle, you know? November is, that, is, is supposed to be the time the bull market really starts. I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. I have two minutes for questions. If you want to follow my stuff, I have an English substack. It's called fixthemoney.net. I do interviews there. I do articles there. Uh, my main channel is German. If you speak German, you can, you can find it on the internet, basically. Um, um, but yeah, thank you very much for being here today with me.